A while ago, I posted a video about the sea hares that I filmed on a university field trip to Heron Island, situated at the southern end of the Great Barrier Reef. While on the trip, I had filmed a huge variety of other animals too. And if I recall correctly, I stated in the sea hare video that there'd be more marine life content coming soon. Well, I guess I'm so bad at keeping promises that I could pursue a career in politics, because all that footage has been sitting unused for months. A big reason I've been holding off for so long was being unsure of how to use the footage. I filmed such a wide variety of animals that organising it all was something of a daunting task. But being the sucker for taxonomy that I am, I eventually decided that devoting each video to animals from a particular group was the way to go. Seeing as the first marine life video was about sea hares, it seems only natural for this one to cover the phylum to which they belong, the mollusks. In terms of species count, the mollusks are the second largest animal phylum, with the arthropods taking first place completely free of contest. However, in marine environments, it's the mollusks that take the cake, comprising almost a quarter of all described marine organisms. Like arthropods, mollusks are present not only in marine environments, but freshwater and terrestrial ones too, though the majority of species are marine. Conversely, in the case of arthropods, terrestrial species make up the bulk of their diversity. Mollusks are enormously varied in their morphology, which makes it difficult to define the entire phylum based on shared characteristics. For instance, certain features, such as the shell, are considered to have been universal traits inherited via common ancestry, and were therefore present in all mollusks at some point in their evolutionary history, but have since been secondarily reduced modified or lost completely in numerous lineages. Because of this, characteristics that are often cited in various textbooks as defining traits for mollusks, such as a single large muscular foot, the presence of a shell, and the confinement of most internal organs within a dorsal region known as the visceral mass, tend to have exceptions. In the case of the shell, while it remains present in many living mollusks, in some groups it has been reduced in size to the point of being completely invisible from the animal's exterior, and in others it is entirely absent. In order to avoid the problems that accompany the generalisation of such a varied group, it is rather commonplace for sources discussing mollusk characteristics to mention a hypothetical ancestral mollusk representing a common ancestor to all living mollusks, which contains features shared by most mollusks, although as aforementioned, many ancestral mollusk features have been subsequently lost or modified in various lineages. Illustrations of this hypothetical ancestor tend to depict it as an animal that superficially resembles a monoplacophoran, an appearance indicated by the fossil record. So now that you have an idea of what a mollusk is, or perhaps more likely an idea of why it's difficult to succinctly say what a mollusk is, the rest of the video should hopefully be a bit easier to appreciate. And even if you're still wondering what the hell a mollusk is, or are perhaps even more confused than before, um, I hope you'll enjoy it nonetheless. The first few species I'll be covering are members of the class Gastropoda, which comprise approximately 80% of known mollusk species, including all terrestrial types. Snails and slugs are perhaps the most well-known members of this group. Gastropods possess a single shell that is often coiled, although in some species it has been internalised or lost. All members of this class undergo a process known as torsion during larval development, in which the visceral mass, mantle and shell rotate 180 degrees, leading to the anal opening being oriented toward the front of the animal, among other changes. One member of this group that I encountered somewhat often at Heron Island was Haliotis asinina, also known as the donkey's ear abalone. 
This is a species found throughout much of the Indo-Pacific, where it dwells in the shallow reefs that girdle the coastlines. It is common in the intertidal zone, which is the region of a beach that is submerged at high tide and exposed at low tide. Here in Australia, these large gastropods are present along much of the northern edge of the continent, and they were abundant on Heron Reef. Both the scientific and the colloquial name of the species refer to the appearance of the animal's shell, which bears a resemblance to a donkey's ear. The distinctive shell shape is, however, a whole lot more difficult to discern when looking at the live animal, as a large part of it is obscured by the creature's elaborate green mantle. The ontogeny of this species, which is the development of the organism throughout its lifespan, is rather interesting and involves pronounced changes in the animal's morphology. Notably, the shells of juveniles are maroon in colour, later developing cream patches. This is punctuated by a pattern of spots, which are blue when overlaying maroon portions and orange when overlaying cream. At this stage in life, Haliotis feeds upon encrusting algae, and it's likely that the intricate shell patterning serves to camouflage it against the complex background formed by the algae. The attractive coloration of the juveniles fades away with age, with the blue and orange spots persisting for longer. Mature shells display a rather curious pattern of irregularly sized greenish-brown triangular markings against a pale brown backdrop. This species takes approximately a year to reach maturity, and has been regarded as the fastest growing of all abalones. Haliotis is a rather secretive animal, spending the daylight hours sheltering in the abundant crevices beneath rocks and corals, and emerging in large numbers under the cover of darkness to graze on the algae that proliferate in the shallow sunlit waters they inhabit. Given their nocturnal habits, filming these mollusks was not the easiest of tasks. In low light levels, my camera's footage experiences a greater drop in quality than the Jurassic World franchise. Another group of gastropods that were prevalent on Heron Island are the sea hares. Sea hares are what I was actually studying on the field trip, and yes, I did have to repeatedly remind myself that it was a field trip and not a vacation. Since I've already devoted an entire 18 minute video to them, I'm not going to go super in depth this time around. I encountered two species of sea hare on Heron Reef. The more common of the two was Aplesia argus. This species is quite widespread along Australia's coastlines, and like Haliotis asinina, is abundant in the intertidal zone. Unlike Haliotis, however, which is a nocturnal animal, Aplesia argus is often active during the day, and many individuals were seen moving about the reef flats in broad daylight. Sea hares get their name from the prominent sensory organs situated on their heads. These, known as rhinophores, bear a passing resemblance to the ears of a hare. These animals may appear to be entirely soft-bodied, but if you were to touch one, you may very well detect the presence of something hard hidden beneath the flesh. For, contrary to what one might think, they do indeed possess a shell, albeit one that has been almost completely internalised. The other sea hare species was Dolabella auricularia. This species, sometimes known as the wedge-tailed or blunt-ended sea hare, overlaps in range with Aplesia argus to a considerable degree, with the distributions of the two species in Australia being very similar. However, while the two species are sympatric along much of Australia's coastline, Dolabella is behaviourally different from Aplesia in a number of ways. Firstly, Dolabella is a strictly nocturnal animal, unlike Aplesia which are often active in daylight. In addition, Dolabella seems to graze on a broader range of algae than Aplesia, although it still exhibits clear preferences, favouring soft, fleshy algae like Laurentia intricata over hard, calcified types like Halameda macroloba. The camouflage of this species is borderline impeccable, the complex texture and irregular patterning of most individuals 
makes them incredibly difficult to spot in spite of their rather large size. I'll admit that searching for Dolabella on a nighttime reef walk seriously dented my pride in my ability to spot camouflaged animals. Now for something more colourful and a whole lot smaller. Gymnodorus striata is a species of nudibranch, a group of gastropods so named because of their exposed gills, nudibranch meaning naked gill. This particular species seems to have only been recorded a handful of times in Australia, and I encountered a single individual throughout my entire week at Heron. Gymnodorus striata, like many nudibranchs, is vibrantly coloured, with numerous orange longitudinal stripes, the feature that the name striata, which means striped, alludes to. The gills and rhinophores display similar coloration. Nudibranchs have taken the loss of a shell one step further than sea hares. As adults, nudibranchs lack any vestige of a shell, although one is present in the very young larvae. Since many nudibranchs are toxic, as advertised by their vivid aposomatic coloration, they are safe from most predators even without the protection granted by a shell. So that's it for the gastropods. Now let's take a look at a couple more mollusks that belong to other classes. A particularly strange species is Acanthopleura gemata, which is widespread and common along much of Australia's coastline, dwelling in the rocky regions of the intertidal zone. This species belongs to the class Polyplacophora, the chitons. The group's name translates to many tablet bearing and refers to the eight shell plates that protect much of a chitin's dorsal surface. The genus name Acanthopleura means spiny side, after the dense covering of miniature spines on the animal's girdle. Acanthopleura gemata is quite large for a chitin, approaching 10 centimetres in length. While these animals may at first glance appear to be completely rooted to the spot, they do in fact move around, albeit at a pace that makes the average snail seem like a Ferrari. Their activity goes largely unnoticed, not least due to their nocturnal habits. During the day, they reside in crevices in the rock, which they excavate using their rasping, tongue-like radula, creating a round hollow large enough to accommodate the chitin, but small enough to severely inconvenience any predator that may be attempting to prise it from the surface. At night, when darkness shrouds them from the sharp eyes of seabirds, they leave their shelters to graze on algae. One of the more spectacular mollusks that can be found on the reef flats off Heron Island is Tridacna maxima, a member of the class Bivalvia, a group of mollusks that possess two shells connected by a hinge. Tridacna maxima is the most widespread member of its genus, being found throughout the Indo-Pacific, as well as the Red Sea and part of the East African coast. In spite of the name maxima, this species is dwarfed by some of its relatives, notably Tridacna gigas, the aptly named giant clam. Common names for the species include maxima clam and small giant clam, the latter of which sounds almost as oxymoronic as creation scientist. Their smaller size allows them to occupy shallower waters than larger species like Tridacna gigas, and the intertidal reef flats that surround Heron Island were full of them. And unlike most of the previous species I've covered, you don't exactly need to be eagle-eyed to spot them. The mantles of these clams come in a seemingly almost infinite array of striking colours and patterns, and it's hardly surprising that the species is therefore widely sought after in the aquarium trade. Unlike the mollusks I've covered previously, all of which are mobile animals that move about on the sea floor, Tridacna maxima is sessile for all but the earliest moments of its life. Not being able to move around and seek out food, Tridacna rely on other means to gain nourishment. Like corals, the tissues of these mollusks are inhabited by photosynthetic dinoflagellates called zooxanthellae. More specifically, members of the genus Symbiodinium. 
These provide the clam with nutrients formed via photosynthesis and in turn receive shelter as well as some of the clam's waste products such as carbon dioxide. This reliance on photosynthetic activity for nourishment means the clams are restricted to shallow sunlit waters. While Tridacna maxima gains the bulk of its nutrients from the symbiodinium, it is also, like many bivalves, a filter feeder, siphoning water through its body and extracting tiny particles of food. The final mollusk in this video is also the one that possibly excited me more than any other when I unexpectedly encountered it on a night walk across the reef flats. Callistoctopus is a widespread genus of octopus containing numerous species. And I'm uncertain of this one's exact identity beyond genus level. Octopuses are members of the class Cephalopoda, which live far more active lifestyles than most if not all other mollusks. Members of the genus Callistoctopus are nocturnal, which allows them to avoid competition with the diurnal octopus species with which they share their habitat. They typically exhibit dark red or orange coloration with numerous white spots, although they can change colour when required. I encountered two of these fascinating animals over the course of a single night walk, although given the poor lighting the footage I got was hardly top quality. So that's it for the mollusks. In my next marine biology video, I'll be covering a curious group of animals called the echinoderms. If you enjoy my content, then feel free to check out some of my other uploads. Don't forget to subscribe as well, and let me know what you thought in the comments section too. Thank you very much for watching. That is it from me, and I shall see you again very soon.